introduce uh, Matt Tullock from Silverfern Farms, uh, who's going to do this uh, customer case study for the, the CRM project that we've recently worked with them, uh, building really out a, a solution for their supplier management forecasting using a, a mobile tablet and, and CRM. And, and Matt's the process improvement manager at Silverfern Farms and was uh, integral to the, to the project and delivering the project. So I'm going to hand right. over to Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, David. Hi, everyone. Um, good to be here. Um, yeah, so before we kick off, I just want to talk a little bit about Silverfern Farms and who we are and what we do. Um, I, hopefully, you all know who we are. Um, we're uh, a large, um, what people would have called meat company in the olden days, um, freezing works, you name it. In fact, Chris all called us, had it, said that we had freezing works this morning. Um, we don't call them that anymore. Um, processing facilities is the word that we go by. Um, but the key thing for us is, is we're going through a lot of strategic change in the business at the moment and really trying to flip um, our business on its, on its head, changing that whole connotation and imagery that we used to have around meat sectors. Um, with carcasses and so on. So you will have seen our, hopefully will have seen our branding um, out in the field, in the um, supermarkets, the retail packs, um, and of course um, our TV commercials and so on. So we're really turning it on its head. And traditionally the whole meat sector has been around um, getting the animals, obviously getting them to a pro um, um, slaughtered and so on, and then going and finding a market to where you're going to sell it. We don't operate that way. Um, we're, we're what we're calling plate to pasture rather than pasture to plate. So it's, it's quite a different dynamic. Um, it's different to what our competitors are doing and we believe it's a, a, a good differentiator for us. So we've spent a lot of time um, trying to get our field staff engaged so that we can be more have a better relationship with our customers and we've spent um, a, good, well, a good deal of time working with Intergen on this new product that we've been working on which is based on CRM. So I'm just going to play a video to kick off and set the scene because I think it's easiest to actually watch that and then I can talk about the detail behind it all. So I'm just going to do that now. We've got 85 reps in the field using pasture. They, uh, they use that for updating their forecasts, signing up new suppliers, uh, signing up contracts and booking in their stock. That information then comes into the office where our livestock controllers allocate the space um, relative to where our, where our livestock is and, and aligning that with our plant capacity. Um, but it's not just those guys that use, use pasture. The whole business is reliant on this information to, to move us forward and to help us make better decisions. So if we looked at um, what used to happen, our livestock reps would interface and manage relationships with farmers and shareholders. And they would get certain information. The issue was that more often than not it was stored in the top two inches or in a diary. So the business didn't have visibility. It's our reps who are our interface. The other guys who go up the driveways, it's not us in the office. So it's important that that relationship is formed with our field reps to those suppliers. The more they gather that information, the more we, as the back office, can, can better tailor offerings for them, can better know them, can better invite them to events, can better have that relationship. We had no visibility on forecasts for our animals coming into a plant, uh, very little control on our contracts with our suppliers, so we uh, had a very manual process for determining whether they'd supplied um, all of the animals on their contracts. Uh, we had paper-based systems which were prone to mistakes and, and errors. We chose Intergen because um, we've got confidence that they uh, can deliver. They've previously delivered for us uh, CRM4, um, CRM2011, Navision and SharePoint 2010. Uh, we've got a, a diverse range of, of livestock reps. Uh, we've got a number who are in the more mature category, who are um, who struggle a little bit with technology sometimes, so we've had to deliver a solution that works for them with their, um, you know, livestock fingers that are, you know, well, well worn and uh, if, if passed the test of time. But also something for the some of the younger guys that are really technology savvy and uh, and understand how how, a, how an app works. So what we've delivered is something that the meets the business need, but it also works for our, our, our different users that we've got in the business. We spent a lot of time with the UX designers from Intergen. The, the outcome of that was something that's, that's really intuitive. So 
from getting something on a piece of paper to actually seeing it work in real life and seeing these guys um, figure out how to use it without necessarily being trained was a, was a real positive for us. We had to make it user friendly so we wouldn't use it or we wouldn't use it properly and um, so and I think that's one of the reasons that they brought me in because if I could use it, um, most people could use it, I'm guessing. <laughs> it's a very competitive business we're in. The farmers have a lot of choice. They've got a lot of choice with who they partner or channel to you know channel to market for their you know for their livestock. We're doing something different. We're getting technology into the field. Um, there's a younger generation of farmer, a more technical savvy farmer coming through now. Getting up the drive with a tablet, um, allowing that farmer to see his supplier information and be able to help us refine it, be able to work with him at his kitchen table um, and actually plan out their supply plan for the coming weeks or months on the tablet is really engaging the farmer at a different level which we didn't have before. I think if you asked our reps what they wanted, um, they would have said, you know, like Henry Ford, if he asked his customers what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. This technology is just so far different to what they had that it's, um, those guys have really made being able to make a um, a step change in the way they operate and the way that they work in the field. Well, it, it is very easy and it's quick. Yeah. Um, the, the thing that I like about it is that we know we've got the space booked in. Um, the weeks are, uh, you can send that back to us and uh, we've got it on our records straight away so things are aligned. Getting the buy-in from our livestock team, which has been great, and just some of the early reporting that we had visibility of over the last couple of months is making a huge difference. It just increases our um, partnership or level of partnership with farmers. The great thing about pasture is that um, our, our business has one source of the truth. So what the reps see in the field is what the customer services team see, is what our um, accounts payable team see. Everybody's working with the same set of information. The results from the field are speaking for themselves. The guys are picking it up. In fact, I got a quote from one of our boys the other day that said, I went up the drive of a chat created him as a supplier, signed him up with a special program, did his booking and had the truck pick up the animals the next day. It doesn't get better than that. Okay. So that in a nutshell, that's it. No, I'll, I'll, oh yes, I do have some other things to talk about. So a little bit more about us um, before I get into a bit of detail. We um, have a turnover of about just over $2 billion. Um, we've represented about 30% of New Zealand's red meat sector, um, lamb, beef and venison. 16,000 farmers, changes here and there, but that's about what we're dealing with at the moment. And we've spread over 23 sites across New Zealand and at the time of the peak, peak time of season, there are approximately 7,000 employees. So big operation and a lot of stuff to manage. So when we're talking about um, why we wanted to do this, um, you can see the sort of scale that if we get some things wrong, it can go pretty, 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 pretty wrong. So let's just move on to the next one and I'll tell you a little bit about why we did it, what were our challenges. So before pasture, um, like Elliot said in, this, in the video, um, Manual systems. The guys, the 85 field reps that we have around New Zealand um, are exactly that, they're field reps, they're not computer people. They are the guys who, who um, do struggle with technology. They're sitting up late at night on their um, internet connection, putting in bookings. So it's 11 o'clock at night, every night, putting in bookings for the next week's kill. The challenges that we had around that was um, we, didn't, um, we didn't often know what was coming next week until they actually put it in because we didn't have that ability to forecast. Very difficult when you're running a $2 billion business and you don't know what's coming next week. Um, other things we had were contracts. Um, part of what we do in our, in our business is, when I said before about plate to pasture, we're actually securing, we, we're trying to sell the product before we've necessarily found the animals. It's important that we, we excuse the word, but kill to order. Um, so we want the right product meeting the right specifications so that we can meet our in-market um, requirements. So um, we have contracts in order to do that. And when we have a contract, we want to sign up a supplier, a farmer, 
to say deliver us, say, 15,000 lamb or, or however many, so and so. Problem was, this was all on paper before. So, our, you know, the livestock rep would go out there, sign the books, and we didn't actually know when the end of contract date finished whether we actually had enough because all of these things were floating around, the bits of paper were torn off and sitting in the footwells of the guys' cars and so on. So we really needed a, a means of getting the contract recorded electronically. We needed a means of understanding when the contract is filled. Um, risk of bad decisions from lack of poor information. Well, I said before, we didn't know what, was, what we were doing. So um, we would be staffing our plants, opening up new um, chains in, our, in those facilities, without necessarily knowing, you know, we've got the manning and all the rest of it, whether the actual animals are going to come, so, you know. So we had a lot of, a lot of you know, visibility issues around that. So when we actually, um, one of the big goals of actually putting pasture in place was um, basically to have that, that greater business agility. Um, to reduce our errors, we made errors paying our suppliers, we made errors in staffing levels, all sorts of things. And we really wanted that one source of the truth. Previously, there was things going around on spreadsheets, there was bits on paper, there were bits in people's heads. We just needed everybody working on the same page. It just wasn't, you know, it wasn't happening. Um, and that all comes back to that plate to pasture strategy for us. We want to make sure that what people ask for, and we've got contracts at the plate end of the business, the customer end, that we can actually fulfil that. Okay. Time frame. I found a, a, a clock with cows on it. Thought that was. Um, all right. So yeah, we started in, in March 2012. Um, it's been a big project. We've gone live now, all for the whole of New Zealand in March 2013. So basically, 12 months to put this in. We did stage it. There was no point in putting big bang. It just wasn't going to work. We've already talked today about change management and some other things, and we've definitely been challenged in change management with some of our boys out in the field. So we've, we've done a lot to get the level of adoption that we've got, and I think we've done pretty well with that. Um, we had a staged go live. Um, we, pasture wasn't perfect, and it's, it's still not perfect, but it's good enough. In December, we decided to go live with one species, which was venison and to deliver that species, um, the pasture booking side of it, only for the South Island. Because we had a limited supply of venison in the South Island, and we had a, a, a smaller catchment of the actual field reps themselves. It allowed us to get it in front of them, and it allowed the, the guys to give us feedback as to had we got it right, what was wrong, this is real clunky, this isn't quite right. So it was actually um, a bit of an ulterior motive as well. It actually gave us the ability to give them something that they weren't necessarily happy with. So when they got the next release, they felt that we listened to them. And that was actually a really, really good result. Um, don't do the maths. Development hours, testing hours. It was big, um, real big. But we had to get it right, you know? Um, as I said, the 85 field reps that we have are all over the country, from the far north down to the far south. Um, they're everywhere. They're not in urban areas. So we all know New Zealand's sort of cell phone coverage is pretty poor and patchy around um, you know, rural New Zealand. So these guys still needed to be able to work and have access to their information in the field. Um, and that's what our solution had to do. But, you know, we wanted them to be able to create a customer, forecast their stock, book their stock, everything disconnected. And occasionally connect them to pass that information back to head office, back to Silver Fern Farms, and vice versa. So whilst we have all of their customers on their tablet, it's the same data that's back in the office. Um, when one of those customers rings up and, and um, an activity is recorded in the, in the call centre, all of that information, they're looking at the same thing. So when a forecast is put in in the field, that forecast is now in the office when they synchronise. So it's all happening on the same thing, the reporting, the livestock controllers, the people who schedule um, our plants to know sure how many animals are going to be killed on a particular day. It's all being driven now off what's coming in from pasture. The other key thing for this was it had to be simple. Um, these guys, are, you know, they're a hard bunch to deal with. You know? <laughs> they're, 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 but they're good buggers, you know, they're really good blokes, but they like it simple. They're not technical guys. 
Um, so you really had to make sure that we design this correctly. This is one of the guys, this is Steve. Steve Dyer, he walks out of Gore. Um, I just like the picture, I thought it was a good one. But yeah, for us, failure isn't an option because we weren't going down a track to then backtrack and go back to paper. This was a significant investment for us and we needed it to work because our business needed it to work so that we could you know, be sorted out. So what technology, remember this was back in 2012, Windows 8 I think was, I don't know, beta at that point, it might have just come out, I can't recall, but we certainly weren't, um, yeah, what, what we found because Windows 8 was coming, that everybody who manufactured tablets stopped making tablets because they wanted to wait until Windows 8 came out and then there'd be a plethora of tablets available. So we needed something that was tough because the environment that these guys work in, we needed something um, that really um, had a good battery charge on it. We needed something with a stylus. These things are tough. You wouldn't do that to your iPad. Um, you can drop them. I have done so many times. I'm not going to do it today. Um, I have broken a screen. Not from dropping it, but occasionally you get a, a defect. But they're a good device, and there's swappable batteries in the back. So, but the, you know, it, it's great having a good device that works for us in the field. For the reps, it was all about the device. It's, oh, what is it, how heavy is it? Oh, it's a bit heavy and all this sort of stuff. I didn't care. I didn't give a damn about the device. The device is irrelevant. It's just a necessary thing to deliver a solution. The solution was where the effort needed to go in. All right. Let me just go back to there. Okay. So it came down. We picked a device. Now, what was the operating system we needed to do? And for us, because of the, um, basically, Windows 8 had only just come out, we weren't prepared to go that way. We needed to pick something that we'd proven and stable. So we continued to go with Windows 7. And in fact, that's what's out in the field right now, Windows 7 um, live, doing everything. But we, what we did like, though, is we liked Windows 8. We liked the look and feel, that metro style, um, the, the, the big buttons, you know, designed for the role and designed particularly for, those, for the um, um, user experience that those guys are having. And so, just to go back a little bit, we already had CRM in the business, um, but we needed, and, and CRM was, was the house for all of our farmers, all the information about their accounts, how we pay them. Um, we had integrations into our Navision system so we could see all our transactions of their, of their kill sheets effectively or their invoices. Um, so it was, seemed the logical place to then build out around that those other information we need about those farms, where they are, what are the forecasts, what animal types are they running on there when we book them in. So it, it just came down to, well, you know, let's, use, let's use CRM and build it and add those additional customizations within the configuration framework though. So we haven't gone out and customized it to buggery so we can't upgrade. We're all built on the framework. Um, We've put it on top of Microsoft Outlook CRM offline client. These guys need to be working offline. So it made logical sense to think, well, why don't we just use the offline client of Outlook? They're used to Outlook. It's on their device anyway. That's an i7 back tablet. It's got guts. It can run stuff. Um, so we put Outlook on there, running offline, and we just used the offline client's ability to synchronize to get the information back and forth. So we didn't have to write a communication layer for this. And we wanted a, um, and Chris spoke about this this morning, user experience design. We wanted an application that was fit for purpose, for the role. So there's no point giving these guys CRM in its interface that they're used to, because, you know, crazy. They wouldn't have a clue. Um, no disrespect to them, but it's just not for them. They have a clear role they need to do. I want to visit a guy. I want to record who he is, and I book his stock in. That's it. Sign him up for a contract, a few other things like that, but generally that's all he needs to do, so let's not give him everything else. And so we needed an architecture to support um, what we needed to do. So this was us building out the um, CRM architecture to support what we needed, and that includes having a farms entity, special program entity. For example, I'm an Angus supplier or I'm a Hereford supplier. So we needed to record that they're registered for these things, organic certifications and so on. We needed to, um, to manage our contracts in terms and conditions and all of that. Um, 
the actual contract, contracts being signed up, stock forecasts, bookings, where are our processing plants? What's their latitude and longitude? What's the latitude and longitude of the farm? So we can actually record the distances between them so that we can start looking at how we, as a, um, you know, an ethical company, can start reducing our carbon footprint ultimately and start looking at you know, optimising the distance to plants, make sure we're sending them to the right plant and things like that. So this was all about getting the right architecture behind. Integer. So one of the things, and I believe one of the key things that made this a success, um, apart from everything else, but it was actually the collaboration that we did with Intigen. You don't do a project like this and sit in different offices. It's just not going to happen. We sat on site for nine months at Intigen's office, on average six people from our company fully vested in that, in that project. We had people coming and going. We had livestock reps coming and going to actually be part of the process and part of the user experience design to so make sure that they felt part of it. Um, we had testers. We used Qual IT to deliver some testing functions for us. We had our own people testing in a total of 5,000 testing hours. Um, we had our own office space set up with an integer and they actually allocated us offices and so on so we could actually get things done. But it was probably the best thing we did. Really, really got a good outcome from it. So, <laughs> the hardest part of this project though wasn't actually the delivery of the solution. The hardest part was figuring out what the hell we do. Um, we're a big company, you know, but we didn't actually have our rules written down. We didn't know how we did things. So I went and asked this chap over here, how do you do this? And he will tell you an answer. You go and ask someone else a completely different answer. Um, so we actually had to bring in a discipline within the business to one, document what our rules are, what we can do, what we can't do. Actually to consider all the different use cases, all the different scenarios that will happen in the field and what they need to do and what are the business rules and how do things add up and make sure that they tally and so on. So these things had to be written down and um, yeah, it was a significant effort. One of the challenges we did have was we started the project and we were writing the rules. So we were reiterating quite a bit as we needed to because we needed momentum. Of course, requirements and specifications as well. So yeah, there's a lot of work that went in up front, um, but it's, um, it was absolutely necessary. Um, user experience design, oh, by the way, we drank a lot of coffee, um, a lot of coffee. So user experience, this was an awesome process to go through um, and well worth putting the investment into. This, was, this is what's made it a success as well. So you, you get these guys um, on a tablet, it's got to work, it's got to function, it's got to do exactly what it says. So you can see there with you know, these bits of paper, some have got approved written on them, some have got for review. Um, some have got stains on them, some have got lots of handwriting on them. They came back and they fought, and it was so good to have it tactile and on paper. You get a rep, one of our field reps, into the office, we could sit him down, and when you push this button, turn the page, this comes up. And actually, we actually had people pretending to push paper to see if it would work, because that's what they understood. It really, really worked. And, you know, and why is this, and, you know, the next thing that came out of this was the colours. Um, the colour palette, we obviously have a corporate palette that we need to, to look at and things like that. There's a colour palette that we use internally and a colour palette that we use externally. So the palette we needed was an external facing ones because these guys are up in front of farmers. So it needed to be the right colour palette. But I don't know, I don't know if you know, but 10% um, of males are colour blind. Um, and I've got a guy working for me who's red, green, colour blind, which is really handy because he was able to do the colour blind tests on the colours that we used because we actually had colours of red and green on the same and he couldn't dis distinguish between them. So we therefore had to go and change palette colours and things like that. When you've got a male workforce of uh, 85 and 8.5 of them are colour blind, um, yeah. And it is, it is male, unfortunately, it is just the way it is out there. I think we've got two female um, reps, probably the best ones we've got actually. Um, going back to the change management um, discussion this morning, communication. During the length of um, the, the project, we communicated all the time where we were at, what we were doing, giving them, you know, sort of teasers, if you like, what's to come and when it's going to come, and this is the plan now, and so on and so on. And um, so these newsletters came out to the reps on electronically, just on PDF. Um, they consumed them. They always had good questions, um, but you know, it was um, it just kept that feeding going that we needed to keep them engaged. And then there's training all over the country. Um, 
So we hired a contracted person who contracted with us for 18 months. She's a professional trainer. Um, I'll just send a few photos up here first. Um, and we went uh, global in New Zealand since. Um, we went all over the place from Gore, Dunedin, Timaru, Christchurch, Blenheim, Wanganui, Danivirk, Hastings, Hamilton, Tiaroha, Auckland and Whangarei. We had to get out there. And we went out there and we got the guys to come into small groups. We didn't want more than about five people per group. And we trained them. And then once we did it, we went and did it again. And then we did it again. Because it had to work. There was, there was a switchover. When you're live, you've gone from your paper, now you're live. So the guys still need, with the business, we couldn't have any downtime with this. We had classroom settings and hotels. We had one-to-one -one where Kiri, our trainer, would go out in a car or fly somewhere, pick up a rental car. And, um, and so on. So yeah, a lot, of, a lot of stuff. We even have an 0800 number right now. I'm not on support today, thank goodness. 0800 SSF Live, and they'd ring us up and then someone would help them. We trained them on the device. So our IT service desk people had to do some of that. We'd, um, including even their home setup, their Wi-Fi pasture itself. So here's some photos. I'm just giving a, giving a warning there, so I want to actually show some of the product as well. But you can see all over New Zealand, some of the boys holding their tablets, they're quite proud of it and some quotes, just to move forward here. So these two guys, interesting, um, don't read all of that, it's too big, I'll give you a quick cut down version. Uh, Ru uh, Rusty, Ross Andrews, great guy, um, mid Canterbury. I love this quote because he converted the unconvertible. So a supplier, he went up the drive with his tablet and this guy became our supplier because he was so impressed with what we could do. That's about increasing market share. Um, Mick Geary, uh, another good bloke from, the, from Mid Canterbury as well, actually. Um, just, he was hard work, to be frank. But when I get emails that say, I'm finding the tablet very easy and for contracts very fast, you start getting this thing back from what was a really um, resistant workforce. And we've had plenty of these. Now the demo. Just bear with me. So I'm on a tablet now. Um, so we designed a, a Windows 8 Metro kind of dashboard, which we can, um, hopefully that's working, great. And I can move that around. The, guy, the guys can even configure it. They can pick up a button and move it where they want. So it just gives them that ability to have their view, their look and feel. Um, in this particular, I'll put my, I actually put my glasses on for this. Um, I've, I'm pretending to be a, a rep up here called Jack Frizzell in the top left hand corner. But, um, and I created just this, this afternoon a, a user, a, a new person uh, called Matt Tullock, which coincidentally is me. Um, and this is, um, if I touch the top one, Matt Tullock, this is him, where he lives. And if I touch the name underneath, which is slightly indented, is actually his farm. And you can scroll through and we can see different information about the account. I might sign this chap up while I'm here. I'll sign him up to be a Hereford supplier. So I'm just going to tap add special program. So this is what the guys do on the farm, on the, on the farm gate. So I'm going to tap Hereford. It comes up. It says the start date, which is today's date. It's terms and conditions, signature pending. I can just tap that. These are the terms and conditions, and I can slide that down to read them. I can accept the terms and conditions. Who's accepted them? I tap on the name, bring up the keyboard. Matt Tullock accepted them. There's my name. And then I can, oh, doesn't matter, sign some rubbish. And then I, then I say signed. And save. Oops, I'll put my finger in the right place. So now I have a Hereford program signature all in place. So now I can book in Hereford. Now, when I did that before, there were other requirements. Uh, just to show you again, if I go back in there, um, on the two columns on the right, farm assurance required, external documents required, different programs have different requirements. So some of these require validation, like organic, for example, you need certification that you are in fact an organic farmer. Farm assurance required is certain requirements we have on our farmers around animal welfare, environmental welfare and so on. So they have to be certified in certain levels. Um, if I now go through and say create a, a booking for Matt Tullock, or a forecast in fact, we can go into forecast along the top. And what we'll see here is um, Matt Tullock 
at the top there, these are the weeks, the October the 14th, October the 21st and so on, going out onto the, onto the side. The green bars at the top are actually a summary. So you've actually got um, lamb, mutton, prime beef and dairy cows. I know we've just used um, letters to define that, but it, it works, the guys get it. And underneath, these are forecasts. So if I tap on this one, it'll slide out to the right. And you can see Tullock Farms, prime beef, week start, it's Angus. It's against a contract which I have and I'm sending in 30 on that particular day. I might say, well actually, I want to send that particular one in on, on the um, Thursday. Save. And so now I've just told the booking office that it's, he wants a preferred pickup day for the truck to come to his house on the Thursday because the supplier can't be there for Friday. So not to give him the space on the Friday. So that kind of stuff we can do here. What I'm now going to do is just add a, add a forecast for the Hereford. So we'll go into the 21st there, I'll add forecast, tap that at the bottom, go down there, it says stock type prime beef, see how it says special program, it says Angus, it remembered that from the last booking I just, last forecast I did, I can tap that and go actually I'm going to go Hereford at the top and how many Hereford, put the quantity, I'm going to say 15 and I want to deliver that on Wednesday, so that's it, I've just forecasted stock. So from the reps, this is, this is a piece of cake. Now I'm going to book it in. So remember, these forecasts are actually forecasts out of here. They could be putting forecasts in for the next 12 months. And in fact, they are. So this is the visibility we need in the business to optimise our plants, to make sure we've got the right manning levels, to make sure we can meet our in-market supply, you know, our, our contracts we've got with our customers. Have we got enough animals to meet this demand? Yes, we have. You look at the forecast. I can now go to bookings at the top. And I'm now going to book this in. And on this screen here, when it comes up, I have to change the week. See, that's a trap for young players. It's starting their week commencing um, Sunday the 13th. I actually did that booking for next week, so I just moved to the next week. And what we have at the bottom in the grey panels are actually the space that's been given to me from our livestock controllers at plants. So we've got here at Finnegan, which is our plant just out of Belclutha. I've been given space for 150 lamb. Um, I've been given some mutton at Finnegan and Fairton and different places. So the guys understand what all of these things mean. And the colours mean something too. But I won't get into the detail of that. What I do have though, is I have this on the left hand side, 15, a forecast for 15 prime beef of Hereford, which is what I just put in. This could have been put in a year ago, could have been put in last week. The key thing is, is these guys can change these forecasts anytime they want. So when you're forecasting into the future, of course, you know, it's not going to be as accurate as it would be for forecasting tomorrow. So they could tweak those adjustments and make them. And if there's a drought, we can move them. If there's a rain event or, or adverse weather events, we can pick up the groups of forecasts and put them into the correct weeks. Again, the more the guys engage and do this, the better visibility the company has. So I'm just going to book that. So. I've got it highlighted on the left in the green. I'm gonna, there's a, you can see there's a, um, I can put that into any of those prime beef spaces that I've been given. But if I put it into a Hereford space, he'll actually get paid extra money because he's a Hereford supplier and it's a Hereford forecast. So we're gonna put him onto this one on the Tuesday. Even though I said Thursday, I've said no, nah, I'm gonna book him in for this anyway. Um, and then I can come down here and I can say watch the transporter. And we're going to say we're going to use Andrews Transport Limited. And, well, that'll do. Save. Booked. When they go back to their home or when they get an area of 3G connectivity, they just return to their dashboard, which I'll just do at the top. And I'm, I'm not going to do it here because I'm not actually connected, but bottom left-hand button there says synchronise, and that synchronises it back to head office. So that, in a nutshell, is pasture. So I'll just move on to the next bit. One sec, HDMI one. Okay. Questions? <laughs> Any questions? Yep. Is this a standalone application that's talking to our API? Uh, this is a WPF app that's running locally on the machine that's talking yeah, straight into the CRM offline, CRM offline database. 
which sits beside Outlook. So how it actually goes into it, that's the magic and wizardry that Intergen do. I don't know the details of how, but yeah. What type of information can we attach? At the moment, we, at the moment we've, we haven't given them that feature and function. We've focused just on the core role that they're doing. Um, future phases of Pasture are to actually get them to um, create more activities, like I went up for a visit on managing a prospect and those sorts of things. But for now, we wanted to just get the core business and the, and the, and the results that we needed to drive the business forward. So yeah, right now, no. But the full CRM capability is there in the back office, and we do all of that other stuff there. Yep. Anybody else? Yep, we've still got trouble with workarounds. Um, this is a question about do we have trouble with workarounds? Um, the people trying to get around the system? Yep. We've had very, very good uptake. South Island, no disrespect to all you people from the North Island, but South Island guys have really picked it up. And I think maybe that's because our office is in the South Island, so we're a little bit closer to them. Um, but the North Island guys have done very well too. We, well, there's a particular pocket um, where some guys kind of operate off the grid a little bit and trucks turn up with animals on them that they haven't actually been booked in. Um, suffice to say that's being managed in other ways. But, um, but, you know, we've got to sort that out. You know, this is the only way to do it. And um, the business requires it. And if you're an employee, you need, to you need to do what you do. We have given them so much support and we continue to give them support. And, you know, like the change management thing, you know, do you go in with a stick or a carrot? Um, we've done a lot of carrots and maybe it's time for the stick. We don't know. Yeah, so. Oh look, um, how many hours per rep? Haven't actually done that analysis, but days. oh, days. Um, I would say uh, at least a week per rep. A week. If you yeah, if you can if you consider the separate sessions and the number of separate sessions we've done of multiple people, then the one to ones, and then the next release and going out again, um, I'd say it's probably yeah. Um, well, you know, I couldn't feasibly be 85, you know, it probably would be a week each. I mean, there's 85 reps, it's not 85 weeks elapsed because we, you know, they're together. But. We, do, we do have, um, we don't have ongoing training scheduled. No, we do respond now to patterns we're seeing in the support calls that we get. So if we see a support call that keeps coming up, we go, right, we need to go out and just refine that again because it's starting to hit us. So we'll go out and say, look, you, know, you guys keep booking contracts in as a schedule price which means that the supplier is not getting paid the right amount of money. So let's refresh on how we deal with contracts. So yeah, things like that. So I'm conscious of the time, so we better move on. Okay, so um, that's it. I'm here this evening, so if anyone's got questions, feel free to come and see me.